Anwar Buhars, who is really sort of the father of this conference, who's been organizing it, uh, taking the lead on it for several years now, and uh, also uh, my colleague Fred Wayry. They've worked very hard to, to pull this conference off. Now, I think, Anwar, is this the third year running? As far as I know that we have, it's the fourth, actually. Okay, it's the fourth year running in which we've organized uh, a conference that brings together experts on, uh, on these different parts of Africa, on the Maghreb, North Africa, and the Sahel, as well as experts on terrorism to discuss the instability, uh, internal political crises, and militant rivalries that have enabled groups such as Al-Qaeda and the self-proclaimed Islamic State, IS, to extend their influence in the region. Now, these issues, of course, are, are important and, and unfortunately growing in importance all the time. But we found it really fruitful to bring together these different communities of experts who don't necessarily meet all the time. Um, especially people who work on different parts of Africa. Now this may be changing, of course, in the, in the US military, the Africa Command now includes North Africa as well as the rest of the continent. Um, and this, this pattern's being replicated in the National Security Council, maybe it even will be in the US Department of State. So maybe we're gonna see people who work on Africa kind of coming together at more as one community. But up till now, in the academic and the think tank communities, really the people who work on the Maghreb and Sahel have been you know, uh, completely separate and they don't overlap that much. So we at Carnegie have found it really useful to partner with the African Peace Building Network of SSRC with their solid knowledge uh, of the African content, uh, continent rather to, to study this issue of militancy that crosses borders. Uh, the Middle East program at Carnegie hopes to bring to this our knowledge of the Maghreb and also our, our emphasis on uh, governance, internal, political, economic, social issues that tend to um, affect the climate for militancy and conflict. So, you know, unfortunately, the current political landscape in the Sahel and the Maghreb provides a solid foundation for extremist groups to embed themselves in the social fabric, uh, which is tarnished by conflict, corruption, various forms of injustice. Um, in my own work here at Carnegie, I, I work a lot on Egypt, and we saw a very tragic example of this just in the past week in Egypt, where uh, local uh, Egyptian groups that have affiliated themselves with IS are trying to exploit social polarization, cynically betting uh, that these very bloody attacks on Egyptian Christians will sow division between them and Muslims, um, and, and particularly Islamists who've taken the brunt of human rights abuses uh, since the military coup of 2013. I hope that bet is wrong, uh, but it uh, but, but it shows you how these groups are able to exploit internal vulnerabilities in these countries. Um, Egypt's not on the agenda here today, but I hope that in our discussion of other African countries, we'll be able to bring out how governance failures provide an opening for militancy and tease out some recommendations for how the people and the governments of the continent as well as our own government here in the United States can best address these problems. So now I would like to invite um, our partner in this event, Dr. Cyril Obi, who's director of the African Peacebuilding Network at SSRC to offer uh, a few words of welcome. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. Um, my name is Siri Lobi, and I lead the African Peace Building Network of the Social Science Research Council. I want to start by thanking Michelle Dunn and her colleagues, as well as Anwar Bukas, who, apart from being an associate of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, is also a member of the advisory board of the African Peace Building Network. Uh, a little bit of background here. The African Peace Building Network was established in 2012 and is funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Um, 
It sets about to support and facilitate both the production and visibility of research-based knowledge produced by African scholars based in Africa's universities and organizations. Um, we also hope by this process not just to facilitate the production of such high quality knowledge, but to insert such knowledge into policy conversations and actions that are aimed towards peace building in Africa. Um, we have some of our publications outside by way of disseminating of our research findings. And another way of disseminating the kind of work that we support is by partnering with organizations within the United States, Europe, and Africa to showcase some of the work that our grantees are doing. I'm very happy that two of our former grantees uh, from Nigeria as well as Senegal by way of South Africa are here to share some of their work on this exact same theme of militancy and conflict in the Sahel and the Maghreb. One of the interesting things, and I'm, uh, Michelle spoke about this, is the complexity of the conflicts and what I call the geography of the conflicts and how the conflict is actually moving and leading to what I call the meshing of North Africa to West Africa and the Sahel. Uh, in the past, people used to talk about Sub-Saharan Africa as if there was an Africa that was not Sub-Saharan. Uh, that kind of concept is now becoming irrelevant because what we see really is that after the collapse of the Gaddafi regime in Libya in particular, that boundary between North Africa and West Africa has been erased in security terms by the migration. The interesting trends, you have a South-North migration through North Africa and you have extremist violence migrating from the North downwards to, south, to, to, to the south, south of the Sahara, and what we call West Africa. This raises a lot of challenges, not just in terms of the, the infestation of the region with this rising conflicts and forms of extremism, but the fact that it's also been a space for contestation between Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb as well as Islamic State. And it's also very interesting to see how these movements and how these trends are latching opportunistically to different contradictions and tensions that are embedded even within those countries and what people can term some of the governance deficits and long-standing grievances of marginalized peoples and minorities around that region. Having said that, there is a lot of threat and there is a lot of vulnerabilities. But I hope that in the conversations that we follow, we should also begin to speak to the resilience of the communities in some parts of West Africa and the Sahel and how they have been able to cope and the challenge that we face in terms of reconstruction and reintegration. And on that note, again, I want to welcome you and to, and, and to say that I really look forward to very robust discussions. We did this last year and it was a fantastic meeting. And I expect no less today with the kind of galaxy of distinguished speakers that we have. I'm sure that you are all in here for a feast of ideas and a feast of solutions. Thank you very much for your attention. <coughs> all right. Yes. Thank you, Michelle, for your leadership. Thank you, Cyril, for your support. <clears throat> and with this, we'll start the, the first panel. Uh, the first panel deals with the new security dynamics uh, linking together the Maghreb and Sahel regions. In the past, you know, policymakers and analysts, they have tended to see or to perceive the Maghreb and the Sahel as, as two entities that are distinct. <laughs> But this distinction now is, is, is obsolete, especially after the fall of, of Muammar Gaddafi. So several events and several actors have pushed the two regions 
closer together in terms of threats, perceptions, and in terms of security concerns. So our invited experts today will help us unpack this new security interconnection between the Sahel and the Maghreb, examining the transformation of threats and insecurities. Since the region is also the locus of competing zones of influence, where bordering states struggle for control, it would be helpful to get an overview of the dynamics of the forms and the consequences of the rivalries and power struggles between regional powers in the contemporary Maghreb and, and the Sahel. So Rasmus Boster, a uh, friend uh, of mine, and he's a senior researcher at the Danish Institute for International Studies, will start out with a broad, broad overview of the security complexes in the Maghreb and the Sahel. He will look at the key players and the drivers of insecurity and their linkages across border. Uh, I don't need to, to delve into the bio of, 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 of our distinguished speaker. I, it's, you have it uh, on you. Uh, the second speaker would be uh, Dahlia <coughs> uh, Ranem, joining us from Beirut. <laughs> hey, Dahlia. Uh, Dahlia is an Aryan fellow at the Carnegie Middle East Center in Beirut, where her work examines political and extremist violence, radicalization, Islamism, and jihadism with an emphasis on, on Algeria. I mean, frankly, she's the person to go to uh, on, on Algeria. She has been a great resource to me, uh, and I read her, her work uh, so avidly. Thank you, uh, Dahlia. So Dahlia will drill down deeper with a more detailed discussion on Algeria and its Sahelian neighborhood. And she will also examine the cross-border uh, jihadi, jihadi threats. And finally, Claire, Claire Spencer, uh, another friend, senior research fellow for the Middle East and North Africa program and second century initiative at Chatham House. Uh, she will finish off the discussion with Zero in on Morocco's foreign policy uh, and role in, in, in the Sahel. And obviously, each of, of you uh, can, can touch on the extremist challenge in North Africa and the Sahel, the factors that allow extremists, whether a resurgent AQIM or a retreat in ISIS, to find purchase in, in the southern border areas. Uh, and I would suggest that we keep our remarks to 10, 12 minutes uh, max. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anwar. Um, it's a pleasure to be here at the Carnegie Foundation. And um, I'm very happy to meet both friends and uh, hopefully coming friends and colleagues here. Um, I'll pick up immediately on, uh, on this uh, task that Anwar have, has, has given me. And I, I'll try to present very briefly within the 12 minutes uh, limit that has been set for this uh, intervention. Um, three sort of inter interrelated arguments about the changing nature of the regional security conflict, Sahel and Maghreb. Well, the first argument I'm going to get around of statement is that basically we have, that we are witnessing a, a a large host of different types of non-state actors um, who together are changing the way we are seeing interconnections between the security countries. So to some extent, to the European security complex. So we have like three, three different complexes in play. And the key point that I'm going to make there is to say that one of the difficulties we've had to get our heads around this is that what's really going on here is that it's non-state actors who are really driving the process of expanding and changing the security networks. Now, so the second point I pick up on afterwards is that uh, these changes or say the interconnectors have, as mentioned pre previously by a couple of colleagues, have been triggered by the collapse of domestic order in Libya after the fall of Gaddafi. But, and this is the third point, um, they're basically caused by very different dynamics and structural uh, conditions that are prevailed and have been for quite a while in the Sahel region, combined with a juncture, I would say, in militancy in North Africa. So these things come together to give us a, a broader picture, hopefully, of where we, where we are with the security st structuring in the Sahel Maghreb nexus. So, first point here. What, uh, what do I mean when I say that we are sort of witnessing the transformation of uh, 
the, the inter-regional sort of security connections between Sahel, Maghreb, and Europe, and that it's dictated primarily by non-state actors. Now, one step backward is necessary here. Traditionally, when we speak about security complexes, the, the, the broader theoretical background is one of state-to-state -state relations. It's basically adopted from a, we could say, pretty Western-oriented, Western-dominated uh, theoretical perspective, looking at nation states that sort of keep each other at bay and complexes where they relate to one another. And the security complex and a regional security complex is then sort of a region where we have a, a large number of states who keep each other sufficiently at their toes to the extent that we cannot meaningfully separate one of them from the nexus. So we have to analyze their sort of security inter interconnections together. Now one of the problems with it when we look at what's going on right now is that it's obviously not really states we're looking at. And one of the consequences that traditionally came out of this, and uh, I think Michelle alluded to this in her <laughs> introduction already, is that when we looked from North Africa towards the rest of Africa, and I'm a North African scholar, so you'll excuse me on my sort of flickering knowledge of the Sahel, but when we looked at, at that region down southwards, we saw in security complex terms sort of beyond Sahel towards East Africa, towards West Africa, and obviously those was South Africa as well. So the Sahel was seen as a sort of an insulator area or a buffer zone between three other sort of security complexes, the North African, well-recognized, and I think Claire and perhaps Dahlia will come into that one and look about structured around the, the Western Sahara conflict, primarily between Algeria and Morocco, et cetera. And then we'd have the other sort of security complexes. And the Sahel region was somewhere in between a couple of states that were not sufficiently strong as states to really uh, project themselves beyond their borders in military terms and in security terms. So we're seen as like a kind of a non-region in security terms. Now, that obviously has come to a change and is not, not as such new over the last, let's say, five years that has been pretty clear to the large majority of observers and even policymakers that we have to look at the Sahel as, uh, in, in different terms, as some sort of region that is connected in security terms. Um, what we are still witnessing, of course, is not really states being capable of project themselves in terms of security and threats and military capabilities, etc. But we are seeing these non-state actors. And um, the point that comes across here is that we need to then understand the expansion and the uh, creation of a security complex in the Sahel as something driven not by this traditional perspective, but as something that sort of actually pushes our theoretical apparatus a bit backwards. And then it has consequences also for the way that we can even speak about and potentially also long term, obviously, act on security. One thing that, um, that has been sort of concomitant or a parallel process with this rather theoretical way of conceptualizing the Sahel as a non-security entity is that is exactly this, uh, this other point alluded to by some of the previous speakers that uh, in policy terms and also in obviously in broader academic and think tank milieus, we didn't really see these areas as, as interconnected. Now, what has come across is that with the groups like AQIM, uh, Mujiao, and Sadidin, et cetera, we saw groups that were whose composition, and whose uh, reach, and whose area of recruitment and mobilization was regional, stretching beyond Mali into both uh, Niger, Algeria, Libya, et cetera. So we had groups that obviously for tens, for almost, for let's say at least for a decade, a decade and a half, have been regionalized. <clears throat> and it is this thing that we're trying to, get, to grapple and come across and actually to push the necessary consequences in terms of the uh, policy mechanism and institutionalizations of how we make politics. We just heard that here in the States, uh, the, the larger security apparatus is now actually acting on this and bringing together North Africa within the African division. Some, some of the same process are observable, although maybe not as far pushed in, in a couple of the European countries that I'm uh, used to, to in, engage with. And I can see a push for this, but I can also see <coughs> tremendous um, entrenched uh, challenges with this in the terms of uh, how do we think and how, do, how are we actually capable of projecting our own knowledge from one region into another one. We are currently running a program at the GIS that looks a little bit like what you're doing here, where we're trying to put together experts that come from different regions. What are the key issues? I mean, it's down to the basics with language, with the 
sort of uh, theoretical ideas about what really drives radicalization. It is economy, which is a pretty sort of outspoken way of looking at mobilization patterns in the Sahel, or is it rather political inclusion, exclusion mechanism as alluded to by Michelle, which is the way we are mainly used to see it in, in a North African perspective. So we face a lot of challenges in the academic community and a lot of institutional traction within the policymaking community to get across this. So what I'm just going to sort of bri briefly get to with my first point is to say that so we have seen this on the ground empirical development that pushes all of our sort of entrenched institutional ways of thinking about and acting politically in this uh, particular region. And, uh, and I cherish that we are sitting here and trying to sort of get across this all by the same time recognizing the, the tremendous challenges we are actually facing. I have never set my feet, for instance, in chat, um, hmm. but I've spent quite a lot of time in North Africa. And I think it's vice versa. And, and these meetings are tremendously important for us to try to grasp what are the sort of the local drives and, and mechanisms mechanisms of that other countries. Currently, I'm trying to sort of push myself to become increasingly embedded in getting some knowledge about the Sahel in order to sort of get my head around how these interconnections between that are asymmetrical on a theoretical level, so we have states vis-a-vis -vis non-state actors, but also disjunctured in, in institutional and in, and in academic terms. But um, that was just the first point, basically to say that, that we have due to the nature of the way that the security complex is changing, tremendous challenge on both a theoretical and a, let's say, action-oriented policy, um, policy agenda. Now, when I said immediately or initially that it's also something that touches upon Europe, it is because that while we have now already acknowledged that the, we're seeing Maghreb and Sahel being pushed together um, as a part of this sort of non-state act of proliferation, we have perhaps been less aware until very recently that there's also that non-state actors were capable to do more than just constitute a new, so to say, in security terms, region, the Sahel, but that that region could also spill into not just one, but actually two regions via different types of non-state actors. We've seen the, the North African states being primarily preoccupied with the security issue of it, terrorism threats, as they call it, merging out of uh, Mali in, via Niger into Libya and from there further into to the North African states. And we've seen, on the other hand, the European countries being tremendously preoccupied with the stability nexus coming out of the migration uh, problem in sort of post-Syrian uh, collapse uh, situation. So we have different sorts of non-state actors that pushes and expands our way to see how security complexes are actually pushing towards one another and potentially merging and, 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 uh, and at least constituting themselves as sort of the key, um, we could say, triggers for the new constitution of, of security dynamics in this, uh, in this region. Now, my second point, and I'll just uh, have to check how much time I have. I only have a couple of minutes left for my second and third point. I'll try to wrap them up quickly. The second and third point here is that now this process was obviously triggered by the, the collapse of uh, Gaddafi's regime, and it was alluded to a couple of times here that when Gaddafi's regime was uh, sort of brought down in combination of uh, mobilization from below, so to say, and the, the NATO campaign, um, we saw the opening of what some would term a tunnel or a corridor of instability. It had different names depending on who, who we were, were talking to, where these non-state actors that were already present in the Sahel region all of a sudden could sort of um, <coughs> relatively unhindered find their ways into the Maghreb and push the security sort of apparatuses in, in the Maghreb and further on sort of facilitate the, the migration flows further on into, into Europe, thereby sort of bringing the three, we could say, the three security complexes into a much, much closer relation than what we've seen before. Now, the backdrop of this was that the, um, the actors had been there for quite a while. Um, we know that the, both the Libyan secret services, the Algerian secret services, had actually actively worked to push their sort of the rebels from the 1990s, jihadists, another group down into the Sahel. And we also know that quite a couple of the Sahel countries did not have the capabilities to push them out. And what happens with the French intervention after the, 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 the fall of Gaddafi and the sort of the collapse of Mali was that the French then pushed them back up into North Africa. Thus, and, and the key event that we are all sort of look, were looking at back in 13 was obviously the Inaminas attack in Algeria, where 
rebels that had originally back from the late 1990s been pushed down into Mali, were then pushed up through Libya back into Algeria. So we have this sort of ongoing circle of these groups that could then re-manifest themselves. And, and for anybody who had had any doubts about it, I think that event, not just in the composition of the actors that were widely regional, those people who took part in the event, but itself its way of being generated by processes that brought European powers together with local powers and pushed non-state actors back up into uh, the North African security complex and thereby triggered an entire row of security actions by the Algerians, by the Tunisians, and, and by the Egyptians even later on. I think that is what shows us and that event epitomizes exactly these dy dynamics, how they sort of bring these different uh, players together. Everything, all of that being driven by sort of non-state actors who then, in, to some extent we could say, set the agenda for how the security um, prisms and the security nexus is developing right now. And this is what we, uh, we in, in, in the third last point I'm gonna make is that while this is obviously something that was triggered by the opening of Libya, and one key policy pointer coming out of that is to handle Libya, obviously. If Libya can be handled, then Europe would at least be able to sort of lift itself out of the nexus. And that's sort of a key thinking sort of floating in certain European uh, uh, foreign policy environments right now, that if Libya could be blocked, stopped, handled, both on the migration but also on the terrorism prism, seen primarily by, by the French, then sort of the European security complex could fall back and be less threatened by mm. what is going on. But on the other hand, and this is the last point, we know that these things are long entrenched and there's another far more developmental and, uh, and mm. sort of peacemaking, stabilization and classic uh, development aid uh, policy agenda that, uh, that comes out of this, that this is the instability or the ability for militant groups to actually proliferate in this region, in the Sahel region, obviously boils down to the, the inability of the states and the sort of the, the entrenched inability of them to provide services, to present themselves as uh, legitimate uh, political actors, whether we look at Mali, whether we look at uh, all, the, all the other uh, Sahel states, there's a clear and a long-term question about sort of the legitimacy and the capability of the post-colonial states there, which is, I would say, comparable to, but it seems with my comparable capability, far stronger in its uh, inabilities, if I may put it that way, than what we're used to, what I'm used to looking at in a North African context, where states are entrenched and for a long while criminal in their sort of government structures, but as states may have some larger sort of level of acceptance as state entities. There are bureaucracy that people will, will to a large extent identify with the state structures. And this obviously has varying degrees, but it seems to me, and this may be a point of discussion, that, that the state itself is even more questionable in quite a couple of the Sahel areas. That calls for sort of the last sort of policy point of them. When we're really looking at causes for this radicalization, obviously there's a deep structural sort of um, <coughs> undercurrent here that comes together with a period of a, of a conjuncture in North African politics, which is the conjuncture created by what Michelle alluded to, the uh, the authoritarian sort of a relapse in, in 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 Arab and Middle Eastern politics, where we see authoritarian regimes reinstall themselves. Now, what does that sort of as conclusion? Where, where does that leave us? It leaves us obviously with a place where we theoretically have to reconsider how do we see security complexes expanding and how do we see how do we even understand their ability to to form and change and it leaves us in a academic place where we would have to as we could say policy community bring down these uh, long entrenched uh, distinct ways of theorizing radicalization of understanding the processes of uh, how extremism is generated and what we can do about it and i think there are some clear challenges and distinct ways of thinking about this in the two regions that we're talking about here and i'd say thirdly this uh, and 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 there it's good to hear that the process is already going there's a, there's a clear call and I, and i see that in a european context as well a call for bringing down the walls that have been erected over quite a couple of decades within the policy community. And I speak here about the, the political institutions 
between North Africa as being a security complex, looking northwards towards Europe, or even being linked up with this sort of the Mashrek area, the Levant area, and the Gulf, and understanding that these interconnections are, are, are much deeper and that the old divisions are exactly, as Cyril said in the beginning, these are obsolete divisions that we have to simply come across and come beyond in our way of understanding how security changes itself in the Nexus right now. I'll keep my comments to that for right. my 12 minutes <coughs> plus. Thank you very much much. Uh, all right, so we'll go next to Dalia from Beirut. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, so I am going to discuss today Algeria and its south, and I have to confess that I am happy to talk about something different than uh, President Bouteflika's health. Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, so the south of Algeria is a vast area uh, and represent 85% of the national territory. Uh, this region, uh, even during the Black Decade or the Algerian Civil War, was a pretty quiet and calm uh, region. Even at the paroxysm of jihadist violence in Algeria, the south was uh, immune against jihadist activities. Actually, the Algerian authorities opened the internment camps uh, in the south during the 90s. But today, um, the situation of the south is a bit different. Today, the south is a source of concern for the Algerian authorities, and the south might represent uh, the Achilles heel of uh, Algeria's stabilities. Why? For two uh, reasons that I am going to discuss here. The first reason is because of the regional instability. And the second region, uh, reason, sorry, it's because of the emerging, if I may say, or the awakening of the political consciousness of the populations uh, of the South. So to start with the regional instability, just as a reminder, Algeria shares its border with seven other countries, which represent 6,000 kilometers to protect. And this is a lot of uh, uh, borders uh, to protect. In April 2012, uh, the movement of oneness and, uh, and jihad in West Africa, uh, well known as the Mujao, attacked uh, Gendarmerie bar uh, Barak in uh, Tamen Rasset. And in the same year, uh, seven Algerian diplomats were uh, kidnapped in uh, Gao. Yet, it is only with the attack of January 16, 2013, the attack of Ain Aminas by uh, MBM, Mukhtar Bel Mukhtar and his international commando, that the Algerian authorities seemed to finally understand the limits and the weakness of their thinking and of their counter-terrorist uh, tactic. Uh, this attack showed uh, uh, that the regional instability in neighboring countries can indeed threaten the national Algerian security and the national uh, interest. The chaos in Libya, as mentioned by uh, um, Rasmus, um, showed also that Algeria cannot be immune. It showed that uh, the security vacuum in uh, post Qaddafi Libya allowed Akim, for instance, to refill its stock uh, in weapons, in manpower. Power, but it's, uh, it allowed it also to open its training camp in the south of, uh, of the country, in the region of uh, Ubari, uh, where Mukhtar bin Mukhtar is actually believed to have trained his international commando. So the attack of the complex showed, in a way, the transactional uh, nature of the security threat posed by armed jihadist groups such as uh, Al-Qaeda. But in a nutshell, the attack of Ain Aminas showed that the security threat changed. It showed not only its nature, which is more transactional, but it showed also the high degree of adaptation and resilience of jihadist groups such as Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. We are talking about a group that has been here since the 90s. It doesn't matter what it was called back then, GSPC, but it is still a group that was uh, that came from the ashes of the GSPC. Uh, so it showed high capabilities of resilience and adaptation, and it showed also its capacities uh, to adapt to regional uh, 
uh, to regional uh, realities and to um, how, for instance, they, they, they were capable to build and to strengthen their networks within tribal uh, tribes and local communities in the Sahar region and how in a nutshell they took advantage of the failed state within the Sahar region and uh, the, the, the big ungoverned uh, spaces. As a result, the Sahelian Sahara space became synonymous of marginalization, extreme poverty and rebellion. Uh, it should be noted that that it is very hard, you know, when we talk about this jihadist group to map them, but also uh, to uh, to to show exactly the networks bec because there is a, 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 an intermix between uh, jihadist organization, between local communities, between state officials, and this is all possible because of a high degree of corruption within uh, the Sahelian uh, state. So for Algeria, the other threat is coming from secessionist movement. The fall of al-Qaddafi allowed Akim, as I said, to have more troops and many Tuaregs are believed to have, uh, who were supported back then by, by, by al-Qaddafi, to have, uh, you know, joined uh, uh, Akim uh, in Mali and Niger, and they were highly equipped but also highly trained. Uh, many of them are fighting with al-Qaeda today, and for Algeria, the secessionist uh, request is a threat also for national security, because because in Algeria we have also Tuareg communities. So Algeria fears, in a way, the contamination of the secessionist uh, claim. Of course, the country has been integrating uh, its uh, Tuareg communities since the independence in 1962. Uh, they are represented in uh, parliament. They are represented also in, uh, uh, in the FLN structure. Uh, but yet, there is a fear of contamination, and this is why the country is playing a very important role uh, and has been playing an important role since the 90s uh, to uh, find and to mediate between the central state uh, and uh, the Tuareg. Uh, but the, the weakness of neighboring countries is today problematic for Algeria. And what is more problematic is the old Algerian doc doctrine of non-intervention. Um, so, non-intervention is a doctrine that is still, you know, very important for the Algerian authorities, but today it is no longer possible to non-intervene within this uh, uh, region. So, to mitigate the dilemma, the security dilemma, uh, and answer to the new transnational, uh, transregional threat, the Algerian authorities took action. They took action on the national level, but also on the regional level. So on the regional level, the Algerian authorities are trying to cooperate more with their Sahelian um, neighbors, uh, but there is still a lack of trust, unfortunately. There is also the feud with the, uh, the Moroccan neighbor that is not helping uh, the cooperation. Yet the Algerian state is cooperating with the Malian. They are also training the Tunisian. So they have been doing uh, uh, efforts in cooperation. They also initiated Initiated two initiatives such as uh, the, the CEMOC uh, and uh, um, the Union for uh, Union de la Fusion uh, in uh, in uh, Taman Rasset. But yes, there is a lack of trust between all the Sahelian states. There is also lack of financial and logistical uh, um, uh, means. On the national level, uh, the Algerian authorities tried to boost their defensive capacities, so they invested heavily in the training of the security forces, uh, the modernization of uh, the equipment. The army is more professional today. It is also more equipped. It is younger and it is also feminized, if I may say. Um, as women has been integrated within the rank. In a nutshell, the PNA has great op uh, operational uh, efficiency because it's spent on personal as much as in equipment. Uh, Algeria has been also trying to beef up its border with the Tunisian neighbor, Libyan and the Malian neighbor. The PNA is backed in its counterterrorism uh, tactics with different other corps, uh, uh, such as uh, you know the special forces, the paracommando, the border guard, uh, the national uh, gendarmerie, and of course uh, the former uh, DRS. The second, um, the second reason that makes the South a source of concern for the Algerian government is, as I said, the anger 
resentment and frustration that is uh, growing uh, year after year from the southern population. Uh, of course, I think all of you remember what happened in Gherdaya recently. Uh, there was riots in Gherdaya. There was clashes between Sunni Arabs and Berber minority. Many saw these riots are being, you know, ethnical um, problems. I don't believe so. I think the problems were more socio-economic than uh, ethnic uh, issues. There was also ecological protest in Ain Saleh against the, the shale gas. And finally, there was protest in Wergla uh, against what the inhabitants saw as a neglect from the central authorities. So in short, the southern population sees that the economy, the national economy, does not match uh, the growth of the hydrocarbon uh, industry. Uh, so, uh, you know, there is high rates of employment in the southern region, especially among youth people. There is a short age uh, in, uh, in land, but also in, um, in housing. There is high utility prices, cost of living, and so on and so forth. So right now, until now, sorry, the authorities managed uh, to keep a lead on uh, violent incidents. Uh, but the question is, till when? especially that uh, the probability that the government will promote development in the near future is uh, not likely to happen because of the drop in oil prices and the, uh, the, the Algeria's revenues dwindle with the fall of oil prices. So the level of violence might uh, escalate in uh, the south uh, part of Algeria. Uh, of course, even if the state and the army retain uh, a strong presence in uh, the region, it is likely that the jihadists that are operating within the region will take advantage of the socio-economic condition, will take uh, advantage of the corruption, will take advantage of the bad governance, and of the rising tension to gain local support and recruits. Let us, for instance, uh, keep in mind that Mukhtar Bel Mukhtar is a native from Gardaya. He knows very well the region, he knows the south, and he used that knowledge to you know, move and build his network, but also to perpetrate the attack of Ain Aminas. And actually, there is suggestions uh, that he had help from local communities. So to end, I will just say that the South, as I said it at the beginning, might constitute the Akalias uh, Hill, Le Talon d'Achille of uh, uh, stability in Algeria. As for the Sahel region, I believe that we will continue, unfortunately, and this is very pessimistic, but I'm sorry for my pessimism, but I think, I uh, believe that we will continue to hear uh, about jihadist attacks coming from the Mujawu, Ansar al-Din, Al-Qaeda, Akim, and so on and so forth, and other jihadist group in the Sahel, as long as we continue to have a fragile state in which the social construct broke or is already uh, going to break between the local population and the central government. Let us keep that, uh, keep in mind that uh, jihadism offer grab and go solutions for very complex problems. It is an egalitarian employer that offers a brotherly community, a glorious cause and a thrilling adventure for many people and youth within the Sahel and within the south of Algeria. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Sorry, Dalia. All right, we'll finish off with Claire. Okay. Um, well, I'd like to start by thanking you, Anwar, and colleagues here in, in Carnegie, and also <coughs> the African uh, Peace Building Network for this opportunity. And as the previous speakers have said, it's a very complex area to grasp if those of us who are studying bits of it have actually are more rooted, as in my case, um, I look particularly at uh, European relations with North Africa, European policy, and it was from that starting point, I'll get on to Moroccan's foreign policy within this context, but actually from that starting point of reminding everybody that the nexus, the security nexus, also now heavily involves outside players, amongst whom the European Union as a set of institutions, but also individual um, nations from within Europe. And of course, first and foremost, as has already been mentioned, is the French military presence, which has been there uh, since the end of the very end of 2012. 
in Mali precisely because some of those jihadist uh, networks, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, Mujaw and others, Ansar al-Din, had actually started occupying territory for the first time in northern Mali. Uh, the French have succeeded in recent years in, if you like, removing uh, the control of those organizations over civilian population in northern Mali, but they haven't got rid of them. And since 2015, when the Algerians uh, oversaw and facilitated a peace and reconciliation process in Mali, very little mileage has been made. In fact, just over the last week, um, various UN spokespeople have been saying that actually there's an enormous urgency to deal with this. And the internal dynamics of Mali are such that you have ethnic divisions, so the Tuareg insurgency which kicked all this off in uh, northern Mali, and I'm simplifying immensely if there's any social anthropologists here, uh, but it's a, an ethnic division between the capital based uh, further to the southwest, is that right? Yes, the <laughs> southwest in Niger, which are, <coughs> is more of a sub-Saharan complex, and the Tuareg, which is more part of the um, Saharan and Tuareg networks uh, further north, including into Algeria, as, as Dahlia said. Um, that is causing the biggest tensions. And can you really, as the question has already been posed, count on Mali acting as an integrated state uh, in future? And yet it is the hub and the main HQ, if you like, of the major terrorist uh, and extremist groups within the region. And if I, I will move on eventually to Morocco, but Morocco, if you like, is slightly outside the existing nexus. If you think of the start of the crisis being uh, Libya to the northeast, and Libya is still, as we'll hear this afternoon, ungoverned territory in many ways, uh, going diagonally down through southern uh, Algeria, through Niger, northern Niger, uh, into Mali, that is really where the real tensions are. And these correspond to trafficking networks of all kinds. So yes, there's terrorism. Yes, there are armed militias going backwards and forwards, as we saw, as Dahlia mentioned, in the Ain <coughs> al uh, attack. A group of over 30 uh, militants managed to move all the way and gather themselves, collect themselves together in uh, Libya, just across the border from um, Algeria. But evidence afterwards suggested many of them came all the way from Mali. Uh, the Belmokhtar himself wasn't present at the attack, but it certainly members of his group were engaged in moving all the way from Mali through southern Niger, perhaps in and out of southern Algeria, and up into Libya. Now, I haven't counted the kilometers involved in this, but it's an extremely long distance for four or five armed vehicles, which is what eventually emerged across the border um, from Libya into Algeria, to traverse without being spotted by anyone. And don't forget, there's a US uh, drone base in uh, Niger, which didn't see them at all. I don't think, in fairness, it was fully operational at that stage. But I remember reading an account of uh, a US officer base there saying, you know, trying to track these guys down as they move is like looking for a straw. You know, the, the, different, the idea that with satellite technology, you can actually see who's going where, it's still enormously difficult. These groups are extremely skilled at moving by night and then covering their vehicles with sand during the day, hiding themselves completely. And yes, they have uh, the complicity of local people because one of the aspects I think we have to consider, and we've, we've mentioned the economics, is to think of these uh, highly skilled, highly trained outfits, not just as ideological jihadists and militants, but also as a kind of mafia. This is a trafficking network, which, and again, recently we've seen cases in Mali of kidnappings of local NGO workers. In this case, most recently, it's been a Colombian nun who has disappeared since February, and there's no trace of her. And there, these kidnappings have happened in the past largely for money. Now, the two nations that actually openly refuse to pay money for hostages are the UK and the US, but there's been an awful lot in recent years of French nationals who've been kidnapped. And even though in public, President Hollande has denied that anything is paid, uh, alongside the Italians and others, there were some Italian aid workers who were actually kidnapped from uh, uh, the Western Saharan region, or at least I think it was the Tindouf camps they were working at inside uh, the refugee camps for the Saharans uh, inside the Algerian border. It is well known that large sums of money have been paid to these outfits. So if you combine that with another headache for the European Union, which is cutting off the supply of Latin American drugs 
which are flying into West Africa and then joining in <coughs> and moving around these networks, you have a complexity of challenges which are very wide ranging because you've got to cut off this network at, at critical points uh, with very local dynamics which need to also to be explored and here the social anthropologists I mentioned earlier really need to be part of the equation because you really need to know the local dynamics uh, particularly in Mali but also in Niger uh, and elsewhere as to why people are affiliating to one organization or not. Is it out of choice or is it that they have no choice and what would they come up with? It, it really is a question of involving local people uh, to come up with their own solutions which can be very local but they also have dimensions further afield uh, and you know well up into the kind of strategies uh, such as the security strategy which the U European Union has put together for this region since 2008 and regrettably there is something wrong with the application of these uh, strategies because I'll read out what the principles of the latest EU strategy for security and development in the Sahel reads as. Number one, security and development cannot be separated. Well, I think we know this. The problem is how do you go about doing this? This is one of these endless conundrums that is enough money really being put into the right kind of development by the right kind of people. And as I've said, I think it requires a lot more local involvement than international involvement, particularly if international NGO workers are those who have been kidnapped for money. That seems to be the case. Anytime there is some kind of externally funded development activity which requires foreign workers, those foreign workers are directly at risk of contributing through being kidnapped, not their fault, uh, to the funds which uh, funds Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb and others. So it's, it's, it's a business. Um, the second requirement is closer regional cooperation. Well, this is another area in which AFRICOM, particularly, if we're looking at the US side of uh, the equation, has been involved for years. The idea there's a new plan afoot for the G5, as it's called, which is Mali, Mauritania, Niger, Burkina Faso, and I think Chad is the, the fifth. And now they've signed yet another agreement, but here we are since what, 2008, how many years on? Uh, another eight, nine years, they are agreeing to being trained and actually operating together within the region because, as we said, it's a borderless region. You, you've got to get the national security army and police forces across the region working together. But we've seen in the past an awful lot of money, particularly from Africa, has gone into this kind of regional training activity. And the forces in question melt away when, uh, when the need is, is, becomes urgent. The same is true, I think, of the Africa, sorry, the Algerian-led uh, monitoring um, base that was set up in, it was supposed to be a, a monitoring and cooperation base, uh, Joint Military Command Center, that's right, of, of April 2010. Well, that base, which was based in Taman Rasset in southern Algeria, was nowhere to be seen when the Inaminas attack took place, because obviously taking place on Algerian national territory, the Algerians said, this is our business, we're not going to have all these others. Uh, engaged, I think they didn't even think about it. I mean, it wasn't even mentioned at the time uh, of the uh, of their sort of counterattack, if you like, or trying to regain control over the Inaminas gas plant. So all these areas have been tried before, and they reappear time and time again in policy documents. Um, the EU claims to have an important role to play, but the reality in the region is that it's individual European states, France, with its four thousand troops. Germany increasingly is involved in seeing the tour of the region uh, frustrated in the case of Algeria because, uh, because of the yeah. She didn't actually go there, but she could actually have spoken in person to members of the Algerian government about the intense cooperation there is now between German companies which are providing everything from armoured vehicles to multi-purpose vehicles which are being assembled within Algeria and other states. They're also cooperating very closely, as are the French, as indeed are the British, uh, with the Tunisian authorities. And the emphasis there isn't an integrated security and development nexus, it's very much security. It is hard-end security policing, um, there are more uh, drone and radar stations, communication satellites I think is something the, uh, the Germans have been supplying to the region. It's all about monitoring and stopping people moving around the region as much to prevent migration, coming into illegal migration into Europe as it is to combat the terrorist uh, uh, threat. 
And yes, there is more concern now because of talk of there being um, an ISIS in the greater Sahara being formed within this nexus of uh, interlinked terrorist groups within northern Mali, which suggests that more emphasis needs to be put on finding a tenable and sustainable solution which includes development and economics in nor northern Mali. If that is now going to be the new HQ, I mean, it already is for al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb with links to into Boko Haram in uh, West Africa as well, so these things go further south. But if uh, the IS, if the so-called Islamic State have been displaced from Libya and decide they want to set up in uh, northern Mali, <coughs> To what extent is there going to be more rivalry between these groups? I mean, one of the dynamics which may be unleashed is that Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb and their cozy associates will not want to see anybody from Islamic State turning up in northern Mali. And so the, the, the interfighting may actually solve some of the problem if it doesn't actually resolve um, the issue altogether. So I think this is, this is the area we need to think very carefully about and we're thinking about policy um, policy recommendations, it's not enough to enhance a European Commission-led, and the European Commission within the European Union uh, is the funding body for development, without clear links into what individual European states, I haven't even mentioned Spain, which I'll get on to because they're cooperating very closely with Morocco, um, but it, the Italians each state, including within Libya, as we will see, not only have their own national policies towards these conflicts, but actually in many cases are on opposing sides. Their priorities are as much national uh, in terms of France, for example. They have a big interest in uh, maintaining stability <coughs> and security in Niger because that's where they extract their uranium for their nuclear energy plants uh, within France. This is a strategic concern for France and its energy uh, production as much as it, it is a security response on behalf of the local populations. And I think we really need to sort of hone in on the contradictions in some of these policies because in many cases the security first, the policing first approach where most of the money and the cooperation is going into that sector is actually uh, to the detriment of the development uh, effort which is also going on in parallel but gets given second place because having strong central states where you can cooperate with people particularly in an area where there are, are imploding and very fragile states is actually reinforcing this authoritarian tendency we've, we've talked about before. So where is Morocco in all this? Well, uh, if we're asking what is the key issue of Moroccan foreign policy, it is first and foremost and almost first, foremost, and last, the Western Sahara. It is recognition of the Western Sahara, the southern provinces, as the Moroccans refer to it, um, as being an integral part of the sovereign state of Morocco. And there is room, I have argued myself, there's room for a certain amount of creativity because since the Moroccan constitution, uh, the new constitution was adopted in 2011, there are proposals which are still being worked out for devolved powers, autonomous regions within Morocco, of which the Western Sahara could be one. They have also put together a lot of funding plans. There's more money and investment going into the Western Sahara. Again, development aid for employment, but also very much security, because one area they really do not want to see, or anybody particularly wants to see, infected by the, the long arm of al-Qaeda, uh, in, the, in, in the region is the Western Sahara. And so far, touch wood, the Moroccans have been successful in doing that. But in terms of resolving the conflict with no process, nominal, virtual, uh, whatever it is, under UN auspices of self-determination <coughs> for the people in the region, internationally, even though uh, Morocco in the past and the UN Security Council has had strong support, sometimes mitigated with demands for more human rights observance, but strong support of the US, and France, it is not, in my estimation, going to get an easy uh, support from the United Kingdom, partly because the UK also has territories that it doesn't want to see, such as the Falklands, and now increasingly in the context of Brexit and Gibraltar, that does not want to see these territories currently under British sovereignty, sovereign, sovereignty extracted without some kind of form of self-determination. So that principle that you ask the peoples, the indigenous peoples of the region, what they want to see um, is, I won't say sacrosanct, but it's gonna take a lot uh, to move out of the way. 
So an alternative proposal for, well, how do we, how do we get out of this bind is some kind of negotiated settlement which has floated uh, with the Algerians, but that has never gone anywhere because what's in it for the Algerians? The Algerians are very happy to sit on the principle of self-determination and throw the ball back into the Moroccan's court. Um, what Morocco has successfully uh, succeeded in doing in recent months after, I think it's 33 years absence, is regaining its place in the African Union, which it left uh, out of protest of the African, what was then the uh, Organization of African Union's recognition of the Saharan Arab Democratic Republic, which is the government in exile of the Saharans, uh, whose armed wing is called the Polisario. You've doubtless heard all about them. They themselves have always conducted fairly successful lobbying campaigns, and even though they clearly are not on a winning uh, winning ticket, certainly militarily, they're, they're no match against the Moroccans, and even though occasionally they say they're going to take up arms again, no one has fought for at least a decade, 15 years over the Western Sahara. They have very strong support amongst uh, lobbies, particularly in Scandinavia, um, even the um, the head of the Labour Party currently in, in the UK has been a strong supporter of independence for, for the Western Sahara, but they haven't really gained traction anywhere. Um, but negotiating a settlement between the, you know, Morocco and Algeria is still a non-starter for, you know, reasons we can discuss further, but there's a very strong rivalry uh, between these two states. And there is nothing, it seems to me, I say this to Moroccans, what is in it for the Algerians to actually see place, particularly since the Algerians were part of a small group of states, including South Africa, who were trying to prevent Morocco regaining its seat in the African Union. Now, one of the reasons that um, Morocco is there is that if it cannot, because Algeria is, is, is its neighboring state, engage in more regional integration horizontally across the Maghreb, because Algeria is the block for um, integration of markets and uh, greater trading opportunities, which is still very low across the Maghreb, then it's invested, and it's had a strategy over the last decade, of investing very strongly, particularly in Francophone West Africa, in the banking sector, in um, insurance. There is a presence of a lot of Moroccan companies now. Private sector, but heavily backed by, by the palace. It's the king who has... Uh, with almost uh, indefatigably pursued this uh, strategy over the last so many years. I forget there are hundreds of accords have now been signed on all sorts of areas. And it is a way of projecting Morocco's future, its economic future, into Africa in a way that it is hoping also will appeal to Europe because it's, there's a kind of north-south corridor which uh, could also benefit but in security terms, because of the tensions with Algeria, it's not been involved directly in, for example, Al Algeria is responsible for brokering the so far not successful, but anyway, it's on the table, uh, peace and reconciliation deal within Mali. So Morocco has actually acted to secure its own borders. It has worked very hard and successfully to portray itself as stable, safe and secure, and in most European Union assessments of Morocco, they will see, you know, when they're surveying the whole region, Morocco is the stable entity in the region. It's securing its own borders. It is cooperating much more than other states in the region over the migration issue in helping secure, not always successfully, the border between the Spanish enclaves of Ceuta Melilla, particularly Melilla, in northern Morocco from um, migrants, uh, sub-Saharan uh, migrants who are traversing I'm nearly finishing, traversing Morocco and trying to get over the fence, which I think about 500 of them did very successfully um, over the last few weeks. And once they're in Melilla, they're effectively in the European Union. They're on Spanish territory, so then they can uh, claim asylum or whatever to, to continue their path into, into um, the rest of Europe. But I don't know if there's much more to be said about Morocco in that it's, it's playing the role very much of being the good friend of the European Union. Occasionally, there are arguments, as there is at the moment, over a fishing accord because the European Parliament uh, asked the um, European court system to condemn the fact that Morocco was claiming fish caught yeah. off the Western Sahara as Moroccan. And of course, the Western Sahara is still contested. But most of the time, the Moroccans, despite the lack of... Um, Direct cooperation, or the for, you know the force in the foreseeable future with the Algerians, 
are trying to act at least as a stabilizing force in other areas of West Africa um, by stabilizing their own southern borders and investing in places like Mauritania, for example, which is one of the, the weaker, weaker states in the region, to stabilize you know, in a north-south um, dimension their hinterland, if you like. All right, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> all right, so before I open it up to the, to the plenary, I mean, Erasmus, you, you talked about the complex, you know, security complex interlinkages. I mean, how they, they, they form, how they change, and, and how they, they expand. You also stated that causes, obviously, of, uh, are, are, are structural. But, but, but the issue is still, you know, how, how do we hold the jihadist, you know, cross-border spread in what... Uh, I think crisis group called Jihad Sans Frontières. I mean, without without frontiers, right? We saw the the, the French military intervention. We saw the uh, deployment of UN uh, 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 peacekeepers. But these violent extremists are still making inroads into other Sahelian, you know, countries. I mean, uh, violent extremists. They have attacked bases in central and northern Mali, uh, in uh, in Burkina Faso, as you know, in in Ivory Coast. Uh, but at the heart of the Sahel stability remains, you know, Mali's long-running crisis, and we have seen, and we still see, you know, widening cracks in in Mali's, you know, peace process. So, so how how do you fix that? I mean, all of you depicted the problems, rightly so, that they are. Uh, uh, regional in nature, right? So they require a, a regional response, right? But uh, as Claire described, the, the international response is incoherent, is contradictory. Mm -hmm. The regional response is hampered by the rivalry uh, between Morocco and, and Algeria. So, so where next? Uh, 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 Algeria has has played, you know, important roles in the political and security crises in. In, in, in the Sahel and also in, in Tunisia and in Libya. But for Algeria, I mean, to fulfill its, its, its self-assigned role as that regional stability broker, you know, it has necessarily, you know, to improve uh, uh, engagement with potential partners. It can't do it by itself, right? Uh, and potential partners here, you know, is, includes uh, uh, Morocco, for example. Another one, it has to assuage fears that some have, you know, in the Sahel about the fact that Algeria seeks regional hegemony at others' expense. So, so how, how, you know, how, how do, you, do you resolve that? To, you know, as I said, Algeria played an important role. There is no doubt about it in Libya, in Tunisia, in, in Mali, and it should be commanded for that. But the credibility of Algeria's role, you know, rests not just on its ability to project power and influence, but also on its ability to deliver, right, deals. And one of the criticisms is that Algeria is driven by, by short-term gain at the expense of long-term efforts to build sustainable efforts, uh, peace efforts. Look at what's happening with the Mali deal. Uh, so you know how 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 do you how do you resolve that? I think these are just for the all three of you, and then I'll <laughs> I'll open it up to the to the audience. Yeah. Shall I start out with, with a couple of comments? I mean, I'm, I think just to start exactly where you started with the question of how how, how do we really fancy or imagine some sort of response to the to the extremism challenge or whatever we want to call it, jihad as a militancy? Um, what 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 seems to be coming across from a couple of these meetings, these kind of meetings I've been in, is that we, we have very different drivers and conditionalities for the, for the mobilization of jihadism and uh, militantism in these two regions. And some of them are overlapping, obviously. There's a shared ideological framework of uh, anti-imperialism, sort of mixing with local resentment towards government. But, but when that, that apart, there, there seems to be as I briefly mentioned right before, where when I'm speaking to people who are, who are the real experts, the social anthropologist that Claire mm -hmm. uh, referred to a couple of times, 
they're pretty sort of, the large majority of them at least that I meet with have a tendency to say that in the Sahel region, which is really not my, my sort of expertise, there's a, there's a strong sort of economic part to it. Uh, there's a strong part that is linked to alienation vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the state agents in itself. I mean, even the, a police officer is somebody who extracts you, etc. Some of that we know in, uh, in a North African context that this, the regimes are seen as uh, predatorial in character to some extent in Algeria relatively much in Morocco, less so. Uh, Tunisia kind of another nexus. And in Egypt right now, the, the regime is obviously uh, criminal in, for, for some and uh, cherished by other parts of the population. And that's the sort of the, the, the part of it we know that there are these uh, resentment towards the way that governance is being handled and, and, and unfolded. But I think that's uh, the, the economic side to it, the sort of the economic networks of criminal activities and so on and so forth, is relatively unknown from, from a North African perspective. So one of the things that, that I find uh, challenging here is to bring together, or, or let's say, put it in another way, uh, the, the response seemed to be local to some extent, that, that there is no sort of one side fits at all, and we all know that. But it comes down to the fact that we have a conjuncture right now of uh, authoritarian rest in, in North Africa, which uh, in, even includes Tunisia. I mean, all these countries have a pushback on civil liberties and governance norms, and that is to some extent different from, from what we're seeing in, in the Sahel, as far as I understand that part of the region. It's not that, I mean, we had a big mobilization in 2011 and pushback on a, on a large number of authoritarian practices, and we've seen that come back for, since 2013 sort of uh, intensely, 10 times as many political prisoners in, in, in Egypt, at least, than what we had under Mubarak today, 60,000, you know, <laughs> conservative numbers, etc. And, and that obviously is a part of the way that we understand radicalization processes in North Africa. It doesn't seem to be the exact same thing that is going on. There seem to be a deeper, and here I'm inviting my, my colleagues from with, with the Sahel expertise to pick in as well la later in the session, but there seem to be other kinds of um, mobilization patterns at play that we have to think into these regional responses. And, and why is that so important? It's important exactly because with the collapse of Libya and the subsequent collapse of Mali that quite a couple of these people here already spoke about, the colleagues, we have seen an integration of these two processes. So people go in, so the jihadists in one part of the, in one region sort of responding to certain political grievances in the North African uh, context may actually become active in mobilizing along more criminal patterns in, in, the, in the Sahel region and vice versa. So we're seeing uh, the, the full monty, so to say, of recruitment pattern unfolded right now. And that means that the responses obviously have to be equally full. And, and, and it's, it's no shorter than that, the response, uh, I would say. Uh, so first remark to you. Well, I think that's, well, do you want to go to Dali? Sure, Claire, and then I'll go to um, Yeah, I think Rasmus has covered, you know, the complexity of this is, is both local and regional. But I think one of the, the problems from the outside is that we keep insisting on trying these top-down measures with working with those regional governments, however weak they are, as in Mali, um, to actually impose a top-down solution. When if you look at the history of the conflict in Mali, it was the failure of the Bamako government actually to implement a previous Algiers agreement on peace and reconciliation that he, you know, the, the, the government of the day reneged on the promises made to the Tuareg that actually kicked all this off in the first place. So I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's very difficult. It's easy to say in principle what needs to happen, very difficult to say in practice. But as much emphasis must be placed on what incentivizes everyone within this region to do what they're doing. And I would say, Rasmus, when you refer to radicalization, I think very few of the people who are actually pulled into some of these networks are actually being radicalized. They are actually just following the mafia chiefs of the day into the networks that will ensure their survival. You know, when you have, you know, some of these trafficking networks, the criminal, you know, Bel Mokhtar used to be called Mr. Mulbo because his business was trafficking cigarettes around the region. Well, we have to look in a very calm sort of way and say, well, actually, is trafficking cigarettes really threatening the security of anybody very much? No, not necessarily. It is only when it gets linked up to these more dangerous actors. So what do we do to actually rest back, you know, the cigarette trafficking networks and actually put it back into the hands of the people who used to run it before, who've got no more interest than just earning money? 
You know, it's when the criminality of this verges into something which becomes much bigger, much wealthier. I mean, the reason Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb, which was originally operating out of Algeria, migrated down to this region is it could make itself very wealthy very quickly. And it's because of the ransom paying uh, for kidnapping, you know, that accumulated wealth, which in turn allowed them to buy into, buy weapons and control some of the networks, including the human trafficking, which is the biggest headache, obviously, as long with the, the arms trafficking for the Europeans, because, you know, these uh, human traffickers um, operate up to Libya now uh, and into Europe in numbers that we find difficult to control. So I think it's breaking down assumptions about who's doing what. We tend from the outside to say the worst thing happening anywhere is jihadism and ideological you know, terrorism. That is the worst thing happening. Actually, if we're looking at some of these contexts, that may not be in overall terms the worst things happening. It is the destruction of local communities, of the local ability of those, even those showing some resilience, actually to sustain that resilience over longer term and find ways of avoiding being captured by these capo di capi, you know, if I, for want of a better phrase. I will just continue on this point and then answer the question about uh, Algeria foreign policy. Uh, you know, I think the solution in the southern of Algeria, but also in the Sahel region, cannot be uh, only military because the problem is not a security problem. But as uh, Rasmus and Claire said, it is a development uh, program uh, problem. Sorry. Today, the fact is that uh, a group such as Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb uh, is that the group is rooted within the social and economic fabric of some uh, some uh, tribes and local communities. The best example uh, about that is uh, how the leadership uh, of Al-Qaeda was smart enough to realize that in order to uh, have the support of the local communities, they needed uh, to use marriage and kinship. And the best example of that is again MBM. Mukhtar bin Mukhtar, when he left Algeria and went to Mali, he found the best way way to uh, enter the local communities, it was marriage. So Mukhtar bin Mukhtar married three times, actually. He married a first time uh, with a woman from uh, the, 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 the community of the Birabish, and then he married another woman uh, from the community of Al Amhar, and then he married a third woman uh, uh, who was a Tunisian woman. Uh, so not only marriage uh, and kinship uh, protected him, but it helped him build his network network, but also marriage is a, a great antidote for defection uh, because, you know, in the, 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 the culture of uh, these tribes, uh, the protection extend uh, to the uh, people uh, to whom you married. So uh, not only he was protected by the tribes, but he was protected by the allies uh, of the, the tribe. Another thing is that, um, as I said, they are also rooted in the economic uh, fabric. Um, uh, so uh, this leads us again to the radicalization, the violent radicalization problem. It doesn't stem, in my opinion, uh, from the ideological, you know, conviction uh, as much as it's as it stems from socio-economic uh, problems. Today, there is communities that support Al Qaeda because Al Qaeda is seen as a generous provider. Uh, there is, for instance, tiny example that shows that, uh, for instance, uh, when Al Qaeda, uh, you know, took uh, certain uh, certain uh, part uh, of Mali, the group, because of its financial ease, was capable uh, to offer in a country in which the minimum wage is forty-five dollars to offer the youth who were capable to give him information to provide him with information about the minusma uh, the. Minusma Minusma uh, convoys, eight hundred uh, dollars for that. So this is a substantial. This is an opulent amount of money. Uh, so this is why Al Qaeda has been seen as a generous provider. In some part of uh, of Gao, there is actually population. The population is nostalgic. Some people are being nostalgic uh, uh, of uh, you know the the, the uh, Akim era because they said that actually they have less electricity today than they used to have during uh, Al-Qaeda uh, 
period. So all this, uh, again, the solution cannot only be military. It has to be, um, it has to be on the development uh, uh, level. But again, a once fit for all strategy cannot work. Uh, we need to, uh, to, 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 to target the local communities and their need. But yet, there is some commonalities. So, for example, uh, you know, uh, it is a pattern in these states that there is uh, an advantage given to the central and to the towns, and the uh, rural uh, areas are, less, uh, are left neglected. Uh, we need to give them uh, more uh, and better educational also uh, capacities, better economic capacities. So uh, we need to fight corruption and so on and so forth. So the military solution in that regard is, is, uh, is not uh, enough. As for the, the, the question about Algeria, uh, I totally agree with you. I think, uh, you know, the, the trans-regional uh, uh, threat uh, showed uh, the Algerian authorities that their foreign policy is, no, is totally outdated and cannot, they cannot continue with that. I do believe personally, and when I went in Algeria in December uh, 2016, uh, I had people, I talked with people from the military who were how can I say that? Intellectually honest to tell me that, yes, they made a mistake in Mali and they should have, uh, you know, uh, acted. Of course, they will never say that, uh, you know, uh, out loud. But uh, today, um, uh, for Algeria to reinforce its border and to beef up its border in that region is no longer uh, is no longer uh, enough. And the, the, the country uh, that has a quite impressive military uh, power should use this power, I think, uh, also uh, abroad. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. So we will. <clears throat> now get questions from from the audience. Please be very very brief. We only have have ten minutes. Okay, so I'll start with with, with Bill. I love the um, emphasis on the hyper local and the developmental, which I completely agree with. So that's not what I'm going to ask about. <laughs> um, I'm just agreeing all three of you on that point. Um, I want to ask about the Euro Maghreb Sahel relationship and the security nexus. I got an email last night from a Libyan who was complaining that the West controls Libya. And we had an interesting exchange because I couldn't think of any Westerner who thinks <laughs> any Westerners, Westerners are controlling anything in Libya. And, and when you think about the Algerian, my main problem with Algeria in this context is not hegemonic. The Algeria is sort of an anti-hegemonic. My main problem with Algeria is that they've been anti-Western intervention, whether it's the US doing this or France doing that. I mean, they're, they're not into non ingerence policies are very much directed at the West. And, and so my question is, um, uh, uh, given that all the Euro Maghreb, uh, Barcelona, 5 plus 5, Mediterranean Union, you know, the U ENP, mm -hmm. several other, don't work and are Maghreb focused. And given that we have to rethink a Maghreb Sahel European nexus here, how can Europe change? How can Europe remake its institutional Maghreb Sahel, signal differently, get less focused on migration, think the way you guys are thinking? Because Europe changing its message and approach is going to be a big part of empowering the local, all the local things you want to empower. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Zartman, this in the middle. Two quick questions. To Dalia, you talked about the uh, the Algerian army being younger, and uh, uh, therefore the generation of the battles of Thigig and Amgala are, has passed on in, to some extent. Does this have any effect on the army's attitude toward the Western Sahara? Um, and uh, uh, to uh, declare, uh, what is your evaluation of the effect of the Moroccan uh, training for West African imams uh, in the correct version of Islam. I'll, I'll get more, more questions all the way to the back. Yes, sir. Gender balance, sorry. <laughs> um, this is a general question. It's a big idea. Um, I was wondering how each of the panelists, especially Dahlia, 
um, what you think about Russia's growing involvement in the Maghreb and what its intentions for the region are and how that might impact you. I'll get two more. All right, uh, Jamal. <laughs> So much to all of you, very, very insightful, um, and I've learned a lot. Uh, I like the view that you all took that uh, we, particularly when, when we take the long view, the long historical view, we, we should always see the Sahara as a bridge between North Africa and Western Africa, not as a wall. I think the, the long view gives us that insight into that. So thanks so much for emphasizing that. But my question, therefore, is, um, is there any role, therefore, for subcontinental, sub-regional organizations like ECOWAS and the Maghreb mm -hmm. in, this, in, in this mix. Uh, what are they doing? Is there anything they're doing? If not, is there any role for them in this? Or alternatively, do we put more emphasis on the G5 you mentioned or Nigeria, Niger, Chad and Cameroon fighting Boko Haram in that collaborative nature? Is that the way forward? Or do we also have to look at the sub-regional organizations. But thanks so much for your questions. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Last question, yes. Uh, good morning. <coughs> uh, my name is Sidi Mohammed uh, from Mauritania. And uh, uh, when we talk about the militancy in uh, the Sahel region in Africa, uh, we need to uh, and touch up about uh, the Mauritanian role. Uh, Mauritania, as you know, uh, uh, since 2007 protects its border, and we should uh, use that as a model. That's number one. Number two, uh, as we uh, squeeze on the terrorism uh, in uh, Iraq and Syria, uh, what are the steps we should take uh, to prevent the spillover of ISIS to the uh, Sahel and uh, Mali, all this vision. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have about five minutes if we can divide it among the three of you. We'll start with Rasmus. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me just uh, give my give my first uh, first thought from, from from the rear side. And the question of the Mauritanians uh, as a model. I, I think that's a fascinating idea. And we were just discussing that last week in Copenhagen at a car in a conference we were having there. I think one of the things that I mean the success of Mauritania in, in actually containing a small power there, sort of capable of containing the jihadi threat, which was potentially very dangerous a couple of years ago and now apparently under control is luring to some extent, and, and they have done the de-radicalization, as it's called, the uh, theological training and, and sort of push back to jihadi doctrine, combined with the uh, hard, hard efforts of security nature. So, so I think there is definitely something to a, a Mauritanian trajectory that, that shows that some of these tools that we're all talking about may work under certain conditions. The question about conditions, for me, is what really is a question when we're talking about Mauritania. I mean, I would tend to think that Mauritania succeeded because other countries did not. To the extent that, and, and that raised the question of applicability of the Mauritanian role elsewhere. What do I mean by that? I mean, when jihadists are flourishing in all the other countries and Mauritania puts this sort of a pretty coherent program in a small country, not really the big price in, in the Sahel, then there seems to have been, I mean, at least one potential reading of what's really going on with the Mauritanian model is that it worked because quite a couple of the other ones, let me just say Chad or for that reason, uh, uh, Egypt in another corner and uh, Algeria to some extent have mo moved much harder on their jihadists. And there there was a different kind of nexus going on. So the battle was brought over there, Libya collapsed, the battle was brought over there, Mali collapsed, the battle. So Mauritania somehow could pass beyond the radar to a certain extent. I think there's a part of the truth in that. That said, I think there's some some interesting uh, lessons in the, in the Mauritanian success story, so, so to say. Um, now, the, the, I, I jumped totally back, and then I then I, I only spent a couple of minutes, but here, um, I, I think the question of Europe, and, and Bill brought that up, Europe changing its priorities. I, I think the, the big 
deal, and, and, and I heard Claire speaking about this, is that Europe is not really Europe. It's, it's a large majority, a, a sort of conglomerate of uh, individual states, even Denmark, the, my country of origin, or at least my nationality. Um, we want our own Middle East policy, and it's kind of ridiculous because we have five million people, hmm. but still we have our programs, we have our sort of high priorities of doing uh, diplomatic, and we believe that we were behind the Oslo process and so on and so forth. So there's this sort of, it, it, the Middle East is a price to do politics on to, so, to some extent, and that includes also North Africa less than, than, than the core Middle East. And I think that, that in, in the Maghreb and Sahel region, obviously France is a major player, and, and much comes down to can you swing France because if you swing France in European circles, then you swing a large part of the European uh, nations. Claire knows much more about this, and she's pr probably going to pick up. But I think that's one of the core issues we're looking at. That said, I think you're completely right that one of the big deals here is to make Europe sort of uh, adapt to this uh, this reality here. I mean. It's linked to you to U.S. retrenchment, withdrawal, and, and Europe will have to respond much more forcefully. And that may be sort of the opportunity in the crisis for you. That's what everybody's hoping right now. It may also be the crisis in the crisis that just uh, sort of accelerates the inability to act uh, on, on both the long-term development uh, policy and the migration and an anti-terrorism. And in that nexus so far, we're seeing the two other ones, the two last ones, win over the long-term development. And we all know here, and I think that came across from Dalia and, 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 and all colleagues here, <laughs> that the development issue is fundamental to long-term uh, handling of these issues. It seems it's, it's around, but it, it, it is losing ground. Even the, the core mm -hmm. development agencies that I'm advising, they're saying, listen, can we frame this as security? And yeah. they say, oh, yeah. yeah, we can. But I mean, because as, as we know, it goes together. So I'll, I'll, I'll keep it with that. Thank you. Claire and the um, that's the big question at the moment. Can Europe change? I mean, in, internally as much as externally, as you know, I'm, you know, where I'm sitting, we're drowning in Brexit. And one of the problems that I foresee is that the focus of Europe is not going to be very clearly on long-term strategies until Brexit is over. It's not the only issue facing Europe. Uh, we still have the euro crisis. But in the short term, we may see some changes because we have elections in which there is going to be a new French president which is not, whoever wins, is not going to look like the current French president in May. Um, we have German presidential elections where it may be the same chancellor, um, or it will be somebody with a very similar approach. Um, so I don't see there's going to be major changes in German policy. But the reason I raise German policy towards this region is they're not traditionally seen as a big partner in this region. And yet since 2011, they've been increasing technical assistance, joint projects, not just security. There has been some fairly intelligent uh, development assistance in places like Tunisia. The, the issue I think Europeans have is convincing European publics is worth investing the money. This is our backyard. So something happening in Chad, Niger or whatever that is unsighted for most um, European populations, governments have to make the case that it does matter because this is the way the trafficking of people and you know the big issue of the day is um, illegal migration and how we manage that in future. And that has not been well managed uh, internally by European Union states. In fact, it's, it's, in my view, it's brought out the worst <laughs> in most Europeans saying that they won't take in refugees, leave alone uh, manage illegal migration properly. So I don't think there's much chance in the short term where there's some opportunity though is going to the ECOWAS question is that the European Union is working much more closely with ECOWAS which has its own conflict prevention network. I think there's been just in the last couple of weeks the 21st ECOWAS EU summit. So I think that is an opportunity to say look if the hopes of regional cooperation across the Sahel itself Frankly, in my view, is a bit of a pipe dream, you know, getting Mauritania to Chad really to cooperate in ways that they can jointly coordinate and stop things happening in their immediate region. A sort of north-south focus where you get input from ECOWAS on what actually has worked, because ECOWAS does have some, you know, it's, it's not all these things are, are success stories, but given that Al-Qaeda and the Islamic uh, Maghreb has launched an offshoots of a launch attacks into as far afield as Côte d'Ivoire recently, you know, it's suddenly becoming more of a headache for West Africa. That better coordination and better insights from the West African perspective actually to clarify exactly what kind of assistance will do the trick. 
could be good so long as it is cognizant of governments doing things on behalf of their people rather than doing things on their own behalf, which I think is the weakness of the current corporation. And finally, the imam training is a very good example. Um, but as I said before, I don't think the issue is one of people becoming radicalized. I think as Dahlia has explained in more detail, it's the way that these more radical individuals who started life as criminals rather than as uh, imams or religious figures, and I would doubt that Bel Mokhtar is anyone that any practicing Muslim would see as a religious figure, um, have appropriated networks through you know, embedding themselves in, in local tribal networks. What I would say is, though, for every tribe he or anybody else marries into, there's going to be another tribe who don't like them. So there's a, there's a, <laughs> there is room, you know, to sort of uh, get a coalition to fight back. All right. Last word. So I will be uh, very brief. Um, regarding the, 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 um, the question about uh, the new generation and uh, the military and uh, the Western Sahara, uh, let us keep in mind, you know, that self-determination is a very, it's a crucial element in the subjective framework uh, through which the Algerian nationalism constitutes itself. The Algerian sees, uh, they see, uh, sorry, the struggle uh, for independence uh, as uh, their own uh, struggle uh, against the, uh, the, the French. I said it's true that the military is younger, uh, but uh, we need to keep in mind that the old generation has plenty of time to socialize and educate the new generation to their way of thinking and way of action. So uh, I hope that answers your uh, question. As for the Russian, where, uh, you know that Russian has been for a long time um, uh, supplier, uh, weapon supplier, uh, supplier for uh, Algerians. Uh, I think the Kremlin is very pragmatic about that. They know that uh, the Algerians have this, uh, uh, they had uh, this uh, desire to professionalize and to buy uh, weapons, uh, uh, so they just jump into the, 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 the market. And in 2014, the Algerians and the Russians uh, signed more than uh, a contract of more than one billion uh, Dollar. I think the Russian are being pragmatic, but also the Algerian. They want the 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 the, the, the professionalization of their military, and they are going to find it in the Russian, but also in the Chinese. The Chinese has been important suppliers. Uh, I think uh, you know um, for Russians, uh, they they um, they um, they they want uh, or they are seeking at least uh, to use their diplomatic but also economic and security influence wherever they can in the Maghreb and they, they are doing it in Algeria, in Morocco and so on and so forth. And they will continue probably uh, to do it uh, in the next upcoming uh, years. All right, thank you very much. So with that, please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>